Welcome to our Wednesday Bible study, January the 18th, 2023. Glad you're tuning in. You might want to open your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 1, as this week we'll start looking at the content of the book. And so we're going to start with chapter 1, of course. As you're turning there, we want to invite you to our in-person Wednesday Bible study every Wednesday, 7 o'clock. We meet together as the church here at Union Hill, a little while of singing as we praise God with those songs. And, and those songs that we use to praise God are also songs that are going to edify each other. And so we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, encouraging one another as well as praising God. And then we also pray together. There's always things about which we need to address our Heavenly Father. And so we take time on Wednesday evenings as we assemble together to pray unto our Heavenly Father. That's why a lot of people through the past have referred to that as a uh, prayer meeting. Uh, though that's not all we do uh, within that service together, that worship together. And then we open up God's Word and study from it. And so we want to invite you to our in-person Wednesday Bible study if you're available and in the area. Also, we want to invite you to our worship every Lord's Day. We assemble together at 10 a.m. for a Bible study where we're studying right now the book of Hosea as we have begun a look into the minor prophets of the Old Testament, Hosea through Malachi. We are meeting again at 11 a.m. for a period of worship where we come together as the church and we worship God through the acts of worship that he has prescribed in the, the New Testament. And then we also assemble again on a Sunday evening occasion. We come together at 6 p.m. each Sunday night in order to have another occasion where we can worship God. I know some people refer to that as church. We're going to church. We're going to do church. Well, that's not it at all. We are the church assembling together to worship. And that focuses us on the key aspect of what we're meeting together for, and that is to focus on God and, and offer to him the worship that's due unto him on his terms. So we want to invite you to those occasions as we meet in person to worship God. Now as we get to the book of Acts, last week, of course, in the Bible study, we introduced the book. We gave an understanding of who wrote it. We understood to whom he wrote it. And we also observed why he wrote it. And we're focused on the understanding that he is teaching Theophilus, particularly about the kingdom. And we laid that out last week. Now, as we pick up where we left off last week, we're ready to get into the content. And I know last week we had already mentioned some of the content of chapter one, but we want to look at it a little more thoroughly this week. Chapter one is, is a very important chapter because as Acts is a transition from the Gospels to the Epistles, you also have a transitional chapter here in Acts chapter 1 because it takes us from the ascension of Jesus to the day of Pentecost and what, what transpired from that time period at which Jesus um, met with his disciples one last time and ascended back to the Father and then in that 10-day interval between his ascension and the events of Acts chapter 2 with the day of Pentecost. So Acts chapter 1 is important. We need to look at it. And so let us begin examining the content. Now, in this transitional chapter, I would say that there are three paragraphs, or we might put it this way, three main sections. The first being verses 1 through 11. And verse 1 through 11 is going to focus you on introducing the book. It, it kind of brings uh, Theophilus back in memory of things that the first uh, treatise had addressed and then introduces or bridges that gap between the first treatise and the second treatise. And I, I simply refer to it as the charge and why. That is a certain charge that Jesus gives to his disciples and then also a certain charge that or why that charge was actually given. And that's verses 1 through 11. I, would, I want to make a note here, too, about this. If you'll notice verse number 1, the former treatise have I made. If you'll follow the punctuation down through that verse, you'll find that it's not until the end of verse 4 that you come to the first period. 
So that means verse 1 through 4 is one complete sentence. Yes, it's a very long sentence, and Luke says a lot within that one sentence, but you'll notice that all of that goes together. Verse 5 begins with the word for, indicating that there is an immediate connection to verse number 4. So verse 5 is connected to, to that verse. Verse 6 then is connected because of the question that results from the disciples hearing what Jesus had to say. And then, of course, that brings us to the point where he ascends. So you have that first 11 verses as one section of Scripture to consider. And, and really it ties together the charge. They are going to be told to tarry in Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. That's the charge. And in that section, he's going to tell why they need to do that, why they need to go to Jerusalem and wait for that promise. And we'll break that down in just a moment. The second segment is in verse 12 through verse 14. Yes, a much shorter segment, but important nonetheless because you have the obedience to the charge. Then with verse number 15 through verse number 26, you have the third segment of the chapter where they are going to select or they are going to um, nominate two men, one of which will take Judas's place. And of course, Matthias is the man. So you, we have the selection of Matthias and how we got to that point uh, in verse 15 through 26. So that's the three main segments of the chapter. And it's always good to look at it that way, to, to look at a chapter because the chapters and verses were inserted by men later on, by publications or publishers later on who were reprinting the Bible. And Luke's original format would not have been chapter and verse. It would have been one continuous, uh, maybe block style or essay style writing, letter style writing, in which you had paragraphs. And since we have the breakdown of verses, chapters and verses, it's, it's very essential to observe the punctuation, the grammar of, of, the, of the Bible so that we can be sure that whatever we're studying, whatever verse we're looking at, we're getting the whole mm -hmm. section. We're getting the whole matter. So always pay attention to the punctuation and, and the key connecting words like the word for, because they are always going to help you identify the context of a particular text. Now, as we break this down, we're going to start with this first 11 verses. And, and we want to note a few things. And a couple of things, you know, three parts that I might break down here are things that are said about Jesus, things that Jesus said, and then the ascension of Jesus. And I think you'll notice the breakdown here, especially if you're reading from a red letter edition, you're going to note in verse four and five, in verse seven and eight, there are things that Jesus is saying. But prior to that, there are some things that Luke says to Theophilus about Jesus. So let's first notice, what did he say about Jesus. He says, number one, the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Here is that, that note of recollection. You remember the first treatise, Theophilus? You remember what its content was? And evidently very important to Theophilus because where he was referred to as most excellent Theophilus at the beginning of Luke, now he's referred to as simply Theophilus, an indication that that Theophilus has obeyed the gospel, and here's why. If Theophilus is a nobleman or he is of great importance, maybe a Roman dignitary, maybe a Roman soldier, maybe maybe there's something about him in which he has a significant role in, in the, the societal roles in the first century, Luke would have maintained that particular uh, title, most excellent Theophilus. Uh, just as a term of respect and just out of the courtesy as it was in the first century. However, because Luke drops it, and it was noted that the Christians in the first century did not utilize titles in reference one to another, 
understanding that they were brethren or understanding that they were one in Christ Jesus, since Luke drops the title, most excellent, it must indicate, or most likely indicates at least, that Theophilus had obeyed the gospel. And so he took what was said in the former treatise and obeyed it. But now notice he says about Jesus that he began both to do and to teach. Now, just a quick note here about the word began with its infinitives to do and to teach. From the standpoint of the Greek, and I, you know, I understand that we, we commonly don't speak the Koine Greek that Jesus and his disciples would have spoken in the first century and in which the New Testament was actually written. Luke would have actually written in that Koine Greek. But just a note here about this, and this is significant to a point we want to make, as we focus on the things that Jesus did and the things he taught, his works and his teaching. When he says he began, that is in the aorist tense. However, the infinitives that he uses to do and to teach are actually in the present, thus durative in nature so or in tense. So what that means is there is a starting point and a finishing point. When did Jesus start his work and his uh, teaching? Well, from the baptism of John, he went into the wilderness. If you recall from our study in Matthew, he went into the wilderness. He was tempted of the devil. And when he came out of the wilderness, he commenced in Galilee an earthly ministry. Now, of course, he also worked in Judea and Jerusalem. He worked in Perea. He worked in the land of the Gadarenes. He spent a little bit of time in Decapolis. He even spent a small portion of time in Samaria, according to John chapter 4. So when you think about Jesus's work, its beginning point, it began after he was baptized at the Jordan when he was about 30 years of age. And according to Luke here, he began to do it until the day. There's that, that duration. We mentioned the durative present, uh, thus durative uh, tense. And so until the day, that is, Jesus had a work that commenced. It began at the point that he was baptized of John and, and entered upon his earthly ministry at the age of 30. And it ended upon his ascension. So Jesus had done the work that he was supposed to do. Now that's important because as we think about Jesus, what he did and taught, we do make the point that Jesus in his teaching, it always coincided with what he did or his doing coincided with his teaching. Jesus was consistent. He didn't teach something he didn't do and he didn't do something he didn't teach. It was correlated together. And thus the life of the Christian should be. But I want you to think, first of all, in the completion of this work, he, he actually did things and he taught things. So think about the works that he did. Now, this would be those miraculous things, but they would also be just his activity in general, the things that Jesus did, because not everything Jesus did was miraculous, but there were miraculous works that he did. So the idea of all that he did incorporates everything miraculous as well as all the other activity of his life. Now, considering his works, think about what the Bible says relative to his works. Uh, we're told in, in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 20 that his works were mighty and they should have produced repentance. The works that Jesus did, when, when they are recounted, when we hear of what Jesus was doing, they ought to move us to repentance. Matthew 11 and verse 20, then he began he to upbraid cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, which those were cities, uh, Capernaum and Bethsaida and Chorazin. And which was, uh, when you think about uh, Capernaum, that was a hometown of Peter and Andrew. And that's where Jesus resided after he left Nazareth. And, and the bulk of his earthly ministry uh, that that area of Capernaum was kind of like a home base because that's where Peter lived. And he upbraided those cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Now the mighty works there is a reference specifically to his miraculous works. Those individuals were beneficiaries 
of his great miracles, they were also uh, able to see those great miracles. And so they were without excuse. Those works should have moved these individuals to repentance, but they didn't. They did Theophilus, apparently, because what Luke wrote, it was sufficient to bring Theophilus around to obeying the gospel. But Jesus' mighty work should produce repentance. When you read and you investigate in the gospel records of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that ought to be sufficient. And, and, and you know, what he did should be enough to move you to change your course to suit him, to serve him. Notice also in, in Luke 19, 37, these works that he did were praiseworthy. And when he was come nigh, even under the descent of the Mount of Olives, that is the base of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Everything that Jesus did moved these individuals, moved this multitude to praising him. We ought to laud our Savior. We ought to praise our Savior. And of course, those mighty works that he did that should move us to repentance, we ought to be, be happy. We ought to rejoice that we've been able to learn of those, hear of those. Also, these works were things de designated by God. Jesus said in John 9 and verse 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. He, he says that God sent him with a work to do. That's the work that, that Luke is talking about here that commenced with his baptism in the Jordan River at the hands of John and ended with his crucifixion and subsequent resurrection and ascension. That work that he had to do, he had a limited time to do it, and he had to be about that father's business, uh, the father's business. So Jesus was. When it comes to his work, when it comes to what he was supposed to do, not just the miraculous, but everything about his earthly ministry, the work that God gave him to do, he had to finish it. And he set himself in, in order to get it done. What about you? That, you know, what a great example in Jesus of the works that we must do. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus as the church. There are works of righteousness that we are commissioned to do. And, and Jesus said he had to do it while the time was to get it done. And, and the night comes when no man can work. Same with us in the works that we must do. These works were also a testimony to his identity. Jesus said, I told you and you believe me not, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. So all that Jesus began to do, all of these works were a testimony to his identity. And Theophilus was able to comprehend that and respond accordingly. And these works were also illuminating and condemning. Think about what Jesus said in John 15, 24. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now they have both seen and hated both me and my Father. The works that Jesus did illuminated or demonstrated sin to be sin. And because they were seen, those individuals saw them, it exposed their sin. And instead of turning to God in repentance, they hated God and the son that he sent to die for them. So the works of Jesus are illuminating, but they are also condemning if we don't respond accordingly. All that Jesus began to do, what marvelous works he did, not just in the miraculous, but in everything that Jesus engaged in in life. All of his behavior, all of his action, it accorded with the will of God, as should ours. Now, we don't have the same work that Jesus had to do, but we still have a work that God has commissioned us to do, and we must do it totally. Now, we also mentioned what Jesus did, or what Jesus said, because that, or what he taught, rather. And that focuses on the, the doctrine that Jesus presented, which According to Matthew 7, 28, 
He spoke as one with authority. Uh, he didn't speak as the scribes and the Pharisees. He spoke as one that had inherent authority, authority according to Matthew 7, 28, when he finished the Sermon on the Mount, the people marveled at his teaching. He spoke as though he was the one with inherent authority. He was the one who had the, the uh, innate authority. He also, of course, by Mark 4, 2, spoke by parables and and the idea there was to understand. He spoke with, with tools or with parables that would help his hearers that wanted to know the truth to understand what he was presenting. So he, he taught so as to be understood. Uh, his teaching was from the Father, according to John 7 and verse 16. He says, my doctrine is not mine, but this, but his that sent me. And we think about his teaching also that it must be abided in. We must abide in the teaching of Christ, in the doctrine of Christ. Second John 9 says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. But he that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. And so that teaching that Theophilus had learned of with the first treatise, all that Jesus began both to do and teach, that teaching is the doctrine by which we can have fellowship with God, if we adhere to it, if we obey it. And so something said about Jesus. He did and he taught. The second thing that we might point out here is that he showed himself alive in verse number three, to whom he also showed himself alive after his passion or, or after his suffering, which was inclusive of his death. And so he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. In showing himself alive, you know, Christianity is based on evidence. God has asked you to believe nothing for which he has not given you evidence, but he has asked you to believe, he calls upon you, he demands of you to have faith in everything based on the evidence he has given. And so with the evidence that he has given regarding the resurrection of Jesus, we have reason to believe. So Jesus shows himself alive by many infallible proofs. And, and there's two concepts here to understand. Number one, he showed himself alive. And the, the idea is he repeatedly showed himself alive. He, he was such that it was time and time and time again. Now, Luke is the only one records that there was 40 days after the resurrection that Jesus was still here upon the earth. He remained upon the earth for 40 days. That's more than a month. And in that 40 days, there were sufficient number of occasions that he showed himself to be alive. He presented himself to be alive. Notice what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 after he talks about the resurrection on the third day in verse number four. He says, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. That means of the 500 on that one occasion that saw Jesus, Many of them were still alive when Paul wrote the book of 1 Corinthians and could testify to having seen Jesus. There were others that had died already. That is, they'd fallen asleep. That's what he was talking about. There were some that died. But then he said, after that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. Paul talks about some of those occasions when Jesus showed himself alive. But the second aspect here is that he showed himself alive and uh, the, the infallible proofs are connected with that. There's a connection of infallible proofs that go along with him being seen alive or showing himself alive. And so there were things like he ate. Remember in John 21, he ate along the, the shoreline when the disciples had been fishing. Um, he, he offered Thomas to thrust his hand in his side and to feel the nail print. So 
the idea he ate, he was touched, etc. So many different ways in which Jesus showed himself to literally, actually be alive from the dead. And so he showed himself alive with many infallible proofs. Christianity based on evidence. God asks you to believe, but he gives you reason to believe if you will but pay attention to the evidence. Do you? Do you really examine? Do you really consider? Do you really look into the evidence? Because that's where the firm conviction of, of the faith that, that it actually comes. And then that faith is the evidence of things hoped for or the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. The reason that you believe in the things that you have not seen, like God himself, and the reason that you believe in places you have not been, like heaven, have not seen, have not been, is because of the evidence that does exist that God has presented in numerous ways to say he is existent and there is a place that is prepared for us. So we walk by faith then and not by sight, but that faith is established upon evidence. And so he showed himself alive with many infallible proofs. All right, now, we looked at a couple things that Jesus said, and, and I know that we could spend a lot of time on verses 1 through 3 and, and say a lot more, but we, we do need to move on for the sake of time because we want to get through this content of chapter 1 in a reasonable time and as thorough as possible within that time. Let's look at what Jesus said, things Jesus said, and the things that Jesus said uh, really focus on two aspects. Number one, a clarity regarding Holy Spirit baptism. Don't we need that? There's a lot of uncertainty or there's a lot of speculation. There's a lot of false doctrine regarding Holy Spirit baptism. But Jesus is going to actually give us some clarity on that matter. Number two, there's going to be clarity regarding the kingdom. Because the disciples are going to ask a question and Jesus has something to say relative to that. So first of all, let's think about this clarity regarding Holy Spirit baptism. When Jesus has them assembled together in verse number four, and, uh, when, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye should be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Now, the first thing that Jesus says is to tarry in Jerusalem. The reason he wants them to tarry in Jerusalem is because it is there that they will be recipients of the promise of the Father that they had heard of him. And the promise that they had heard of him regarded the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, true, he is quoting something John said in, in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11, in Luke chapter 3 and verse number 16, it was John the baptizer who first mentioned this matter of Holy Spirit baptism. And recall on the banks of the Jordan when those Pharisees and those Sadducees or scribes even came to the baptism of John to observe, to see what was going on. So many of the common people were, were responding to John and his teaching and being baptized of him in the Jordan. So a delegation was sent and he had something to say to them. And, and in Focusing on that multitude, he said two things in Matthew 3 and verse number 11. There was one standing among them who is greater than himself. Now, the greater than John the Baptist in that context, of course, is Jesus. And he says of this Jesus, this Messiah, he is going to baptize with the Holy Ghost and he's going to baptize with fire. Now, in our discussion of Matthew chapter 3, we had focused on the matter of of the fire and what that meant. They're not the same. In fact, the baptism of fire had a reference to punishment. It had a, a reference to being judged guilty and paying the consequence of that. And in the context, the three occasions that fire is mentioned, look at them. One is being baptized with fire. There's also the unquenchable fire with which the chaff is going to be burned up. And and so as you look to those three occasions where fire is mentioned, and, and in the same context, it's going to be used consistently the same way, that baptism of fire was a matter of Jesus' punishment 
And of course, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7 speaks of inflaming fire taking vengeance. So we understand what that means. The reason he doesn't mention that part of it here is because it's not important to the subject matter of this moment. It is the understanding that Jesus will not only administer that baptism of fire, that overwhelming of fire, that vengeance of fire, he was also going to administer the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, John just says there's some of you that are standing here. He's going to baptize some of you with the Holy Spirit. And that might beg the question at that juncture, well, who? Who is going to receive this baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, Jesus gives us some clarity. And if we'll allow Jesus to interpret, if we'll allow Jesus to explain it to us, then we'll actually have the right understanding of it. Jesus says that in, in gathering with them, assembling with them, that they are to wait for the promise of the Father. And he says, ye, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Every pronoun must have an antecedent that it takes the place of, because a pronoun takes the place of a noun. And, and so when you look at this noun, person, place, thing, or idea, in the context, who or what is the pronoun taking the place of? Who are the them? Who is the ye? Well, the nearest antecedent goes back to verse number two. He gave commandment unto his apostles whom he hath chosen. And, and those two ideas, apostles and chosen, indicate that we're looking at the select group of men, not the mass of disciples, but those at this time, 11 men, because Judas is no longer with him. He was one of those original chosen uh, that, that went out and hanged himself. We'll talk more about that in, later in the passage. But here he is talking to his apostles. It is the apostles that Jesus says, will receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You have to remember and allow Jesus to interpret that. And of course, he is the administrator because John said he would baptize with the Holy Ghost. So we must remember to whom he is speaking. He's talking to the apostles. It's not a promise with indefinite recipients. It was a promise that was given only to his apostles. And then, of course, we must remember that Jesus is the administrator of this baptism. Now, later on in, in the New Testament, Paul is going to talk about the one baptism. And you'll remember that through the book of Acts, as we study it out, you're going to find out that there are individuals on one occasion in chapter 2, 3,000. Then you're going to have a group of Samaritans. You're going to have a eunuch. You're going to have uh, Lydia. You're going to have... Uh, a jailer in Acts chapter 16, you're going to have others that are actually baptized. And the administrators of those baptisms are going to be Peter in Acts chapter 2 and the other apostles. It's going to be Philip, the evangelist, dealing with Acts chapter 8 and the Samaritans and the eunuch. You're going to see that Paul administered baptism in, in some occasions. And then there were occasions when Paul simply did the preaching according to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in which others did the administration of the baptizing. He, he did baptize those of the house of Stephanus, but of others he, he didn't recall or didn't know of any others in Corinth that he had baptized. So Paul was the administrator of baptism in Corinth. So if Holy Spirit baptism is administered by Jesus, but we see a baptism in the book of Acts and later in the New Testament that is administered by others, then that baptism would not be Holy Spirit baptism. And we would also have to include the fact that Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4 through verse 6 that there is only one baptism. That is only one valid baptism. So if there is only one valid baptism, and that regards even the, those in Ephesus to whom Paul converted in Acts chapter 19 and administered that baptism, wouldn't we have to conclude then that the baptism of Acts 2 and, and onward is not the same as the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Of course we would, because Jesus is the administrator of Holy Spirit baptism, but others administered 
the one baptism of the New Testament. So that helps clarify a matter regarding the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that it was something for whom the apostles were to be recipients, and it was to be administered by Jesus. And we also need to remember it wasn't going to happen many days hence, because he said um, that at the end of verse 5, ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. It happens to only be 10 days, because you'll notice in verse number uh, one through four of chapter two, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, being filled, overwhelmed, enveloped. The idea of baptism there, that occurred on the day of Pentecost. And so they they had the baptism of the Holy Spirit administered. After that point, what you see is the preaching of New Testament baptism, the one baptism of, e of Ephesians chapter four, and it was administered that first occasion by Peter and the other apostles. Uh, later by Philip, uh, later by Paul, even some by Apollos, as we learn from, from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So we understand some things about that. We also need to know this, and, and we're going to have to look at the next statement of Jesus, but just so you know, verse number 8 says, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. This baptism of the Holy Spirit was going to empower those apostles for the purpose, according to verse number 8, of being witnesses of me or unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. So this power is, is going to be administered with or come with the Holy Spirit baptism administered by Jesus. And it was going to empower those disciples as witnesses. And we'll have something else to say about that and why that was even needed in just a moment. But that's four things that really are clarified about Holy Spirit baptism. Now, if if there's anything that is taught today about Holy Spirit baptism that does not coincide with what has just been clarified here in the book of Acts, then, then what we need to do is reject that which didn't come from Jesus and accept that which did. And what we have here in Acts chapter 1 is what came from Jesus as he clarifies the matter. So that tells us something about the Holy Spirit. And we'll have, of course, more to say about that as we get into Acts chapter 2 and even look at the prophecy of Joel. But we have that much to say right now. Now, the second thing that is said is in response to a question by the disciples. They asked, based on what is just said, that the Holy Spirit, they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. They're going to ask, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? see, they got a question about the kingdom and, and their idea of restore. The word there means to restore uh, to a former state. And what, what is in their mind is a return to the physical earthly kingdom at its zenith, like in the days of David and Solomon. That was the hope of, of every Jew up to this point, of every Israelite. Their hope for the Messiah was a restoration of that earthly physical kingdom. But that's not the nature of the kingdom. But nonetheless, these apostles have a misunderstanding, even at this late juncture. Well, folks, that's one reason why the baptism of the Holy Spirit was going to be absolutely essential. These individuals, these apostles, were going to be the witnesses of Jesus. And as witnesses of Jesus, they were going to have to be able to witness flawlessly. They were going to have to be able to teach or present the revelation of God flawlessly. And you see here in verse number six that they're still, from their human perspective, there is a flaw in their knowledge. But now Jesus, in telling them about the promise of the Holy Spirit, remember the words of, of the book of John? John 14, 16, when he said, and I will pray the Father, he shall give you another comforter, that may abide with you forever, because Jesus wasn't going to always be there, but he would send a comforter that would remain with them. Uh, John 15, 26, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. He will bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. John 15, 26, but when the comforter is come, whom I will send in, uh, unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Remember, they're going to be witnesses. 
But this Holy Spirit baptism is going to enable them, going to inspire them, going to make of them perfect witnesses, not perfect in sinlessness in every aspect of their life, but in their testimony regarding Jesus and, and bringing forth his truth, binding what has already been bound in heaven and loosing what God has loosed, according to Matthew chapter 16 and, and verse 18 and 19, the Spirit was going to, to equip them for that task. And that's why they need the Holy Spirit. Of course, now we have the complete New Testament product. And all scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. We don't need the baptism of the Holy Spirit today. We don't need the inspiration of the Holy Spirit today because we have the product of inspired men who were inspired by the Holy Spirit in writing the New Testament Matthew through Revelation is the directive or the guide for the church, the kingdom of God today. And so those men having, having skewed knowledge or having misconceptions about the kingdom needed that direction. They needed that guidance as they were going to be the witnesses that would present the truth to all. And in order to be uh, those witnesses, they would receive. Now, Jesus did say it's not for you to know. I want to make a quick point about this before we move on. When they ask the question about the timing of the kingdom, no, no, their question is regarding the time of it. When is the kingdom going to be established? Is it now? Is it, is it in, in just a short amount of time going to come? He says it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. It's not for you to know the short term or the long term. Uh, the plans of God or the that which God has kept under his authority. I want you to remember uh, the passage of Ecclesiastes or of Deuteronomy rather 29, 29, that said the secret things belong to unto the Lord, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. There were things even under the law of Moses that were classified or that were presented as secret things, things that pertain to uh, the Lord and, and that which was under his authority that man was not privy to. And Moses simply tells them, those things belong to God. You do not need to look into those. You don't need to concern yourself with those. You don't need to present questions about those because there is that which God has revealed and that's what you need to be focused on. We would do well to, to mind that particular principle. Let us look into the things that he has revealed. Let us look into what is presented in God's word and, and stop looking into the things about which we do not know. Uh, you know, we're going to talk about the ascension of Jesus. There were those uh, still even today who are trying to predict the coming of the Lord. Well, they're getting into something of which they have no authority. That is something that pertains to the Lord, the secret of the Lord, or that which is under the authority of God that we have no right to. Otherwise, he would have told us. It wasn't revealed. All he said about it was, it would so come as a thief in the night. Jesus even said in Matthew 24 that no man knoweth, not even the angels of heaven. So when you think about that which God knows that he has not given to us, we would do better not to even gander a look into it. Uh, we need to concern ourselves with things that God has revealed in his word and, and leave alone the things that he hasn't spoken of. Let's stop the speculation uh, about things that God has not made us privy to. Some people waste their time talking about things they cannot know because they, they are things that belong to God. Jesus focused the disciples' attention on the things that they could know and should know. So we, we have that point. Now, let us move on to the ascension for just a moment, because as we look in verses 9 through 11, you'll notice that as Jesus said that regarding the uh, reception of power, just another note about that. Mark 9, 1 says the kingdom of God would come with power, and some of those standing there that day would see it come with that power. Well, now he says you'll receive power when the Holy Ghost comes. So when the Holy Ghost comes, 
when that baptism of the Holy Spirit took place, then the, the commencement of the kingdom would be upon us. The kingdom would begin because the kingdom would come with that power. Now, as he had spoken these things, he finished the, the last of this that he needed to, to speak to his disciples regarding the kingdom. He was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. While they looked up steadfastly toward heaven, uh, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which said also, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Notice they tell us something about the second coming of Christ. Jesus ascended to the Father. He departed visibly. He was taken up out of their sight. They beheld as he was taken up. So visibly, he was received out of their sight. He departed in a cloud. And he departed with angels because two men in white apparel uh, were, were there beside the men of Galilee. He will so come in like manner? Well, he'll come visibly. Revelation 1.7 says, every eye shall see him. So understand this. When Jesus comes again, you won't miss it. Nobody will. I know some people talk about missing out, uh, uh, that some would miss out because the nature of the rapture. The, the idea of the rapture is not presented in the scriptures. Um, he said he'll come in like manner. They saw him go visibly, and he'll come in the same manner. And Revelation 1-7 says that every eye will see him. He'll come with the clouds. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17 declares that he'll come in the clouds. He departed with angels. Matthew 25, 31 says, bringing his angels with him. So does 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. Even 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 7 says he'll bring his angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those that know not God and that obey not the gospel of Christ. According to John 14, 3, though, he's coming to receive his own. And so as we think about Jesus coming again, very important that we focus on the fact that, that his disciples, his apostles here are told he's coming again. Now, let us note that the ascension was important. There's at least four things that we can say are, are important here because John 16, 7, he said he couldn't send the comforter that is the Holy Spirit, unless he went to the Father. And so to go to the Father would allow him to send the, the comforter, the other comforter like unto himself. It would be then in that ascension that he would receive his throne. He can't establish his kingdom. He can't receive his kingdom until he ascends back to the Father, according to Daniel 7, 13 and 14. And of course, by Acts 2, he's sitting at the right hand of God, both Lord and Christ. He's sitting as king. He received his, his dominion. He received his kingdom because he ascended back to the Father. It was also to present his blood. He had to ascend to the Father to present that blood for the atonement of sin. Hebrews 9, 12 through 14. Hebrews 9, 24 through 26. And he also needed to ascend back so that he could mediate and advocate for you and I. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5 says there's one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. 1 John chapter 2 tells us that we're not to sin. Beloved, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So in order to, to uh, mediate, in order to advocate, he had to ascend. He had to go back to heaven, and that he did. And so we have the ascension in verse 9 through 11. Now, in the brief time that that I think we have remaining, uh, I don't know how you listen to this. You might break it up. I try to keep it somewhere around an, an hour interval uh, discussion, somewhere between 50 and 60 minutes. And I think we're about the 49-minute mark now. But with verse number 12 through verse number 14, I want you to note the return to Jerusalem. These apostles unequivocally did what Jesus said to do. He ascended up out of their sight. But of, of the last thing that he told them to do was go to Jerusalem and wait. And it says in verse 12, they returned unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. So they unequivocally did what Jesus said to do. 
They are so convinced, and rightfully so, that Jesus is who he said he was, the Messiah, the Son of God. And they are so uh, strong in their belief that he is to be hearkened unto, he is to be heard, and he is to be followed, that they did exactly what Jesus said to do. They went back to Jerusalem and they waited. The Sabbath day's journey there is about the equivalent of seven-tenths of a mile, two 2,000 cubits or 2,000 paces, about 1,200 yards. Um, just a quick note about that. The Sabbath day's journey was something that was uh, concocted by the tradition of the fathers. When you go back to the Old Testament books that lay out the Sabbath day and its, its restrictions and so forth, there wasn't such as a Sabbath day's journey. But it did because it developed as a tradition among the Jews to only travel so far on the Sabbath day, it became a it became a a uh, measurement of of distance, and since it was about seven tenths of a mile, and in our standards, twelve hundred yards or two thousand cubits, then you by saying Sabbath day's journey, you understood how long of a distance you were talking about. They continued in prayer. This whole uh, time, which elapsed, was ten days. The 40 days that Jesus was with them, he departs, he, he ascends back to heaven, and it'll be 10 days before the Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost. There was 50 days between the Sabbath of the Passover, that Sabbath day connected with the Passover, and the commencement of the, the day of Pentecost, which was always a Sunday. 50 days, seven Sabbaths plus one day, as according to the law. And so for 10 days, they waited in Jerusalem and in that time, they took time or opportunity to pray, which the word pray there is actually used even in a generic sense of, of not specifically communication of prayer, but as worship in general. So they were worshiping God, and, and by means of, of prayer at least, they are communicating to God during that time. What, what better thing to do could you do than to pray or to worship God in that time of waiting. Verse 15 speaks of the group being about 120 members because he lists the apostles. He talks about uh, the women. He talks about Mary, the mother of Jesus, and even Jesus's brothers, and a totality of about 120 people in this assembling. Now, uh, that 120, as some commentators might suggest, the Jewish tradition or the, the Jewish customary practice was in order to be constituted as a community, you needed at least 120 people, a community that could establish its own council. Uh, maybe that's what this was about, but mo most likely, as you read through the book of Acts and you, you kind of think about what Luke is doing as he rolls it out, the next number that you're going to hear in this regard is 3,000. Then you're going to hear 5,000 men. Then you're going to hear a great company of priests. Then you're going to hear the term multitude. Most likely, this 120 is laying out the ratio of growth. No doubt the 120 is part of that original 3,000 on the day of Pentecost, but at this early juncture, you have 120 individuals that are close with uh, the, the apostles of our Lord. On the day of Pentecost, with the first sermon, that number becomes 3,000 who are going to obey the gospel. And then you're going to have 5,000 men, a number that didn't count the, the, the women in chapter 5. So most likely it's just about the ratio of growth, the expansion of this kingdom in such a, a broad way in a quick fashion. Now, they, they're going to fill the vacancy. Um, verse 15 through 26, we have in this 10 day interval, we have Peter standing up and addressing this matter of the need to fill Judas's place. Uh, Peter's assessment of Judas is given and it's not flattering. Uh, let that be a lesson to us. Let us understand that, that he wasn't concerned about speaking well of the dead if the dead were not to be spoken well of. Uh, it didn't matter that what he said was uh, able to be perceived as insensitive to the dead. 
he he gave his assessment of Judas, and and he's right. He he gives the correct assessment based on what we know of Judas from Matthew through John in the kind of life he lived. Now he says two things based on prophecy. He refers to uh, inspiration first of all. He understood the concept of inspiration that the Holy Spirit spake by the mouth of David. So the inspiration was uh, regarding the Holy Spirit giving forth the communication by David's mouth. So David became the instrument by which the Holy Spirit could, could write these things. And he references Psalm 69 and verse 25 and Psalm 109 and verse 8. And two things are said here. Number one, let his habitation be desolate. Now, in Psalm 69, 25, whether that, you know, as you go back to the Old Testament and, and read Psalm 69, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily lead you to Judas. But as Peter looks at it, he understands this to be a fulfillment of the situation with Judas uh, from that imprecatory psalm. And this idea of his habitation being left desolate has already been fulfilled in Peter's mind because of what happened with the field. Now, uh, Judas went out and hanged himself. There's no, no discrepancy between Matthew's record in Matthew 27 and Luke's record right here regarding Judas. Uh, he went out and hanged himself. And in hanging himself, it appears that once that was accomplished, somehow or another, Judas fell from that tree, from the position of being hung. And when he fell headlong, he burst asunder. Now, we don't have to get into the biology of a, of a corpse and what, it can, what can happen to it in the, in the heat and, and so forth, and bloating of the gases and all of that. But uh, here's what we do know. Judas hung himself, according to Matthew. Luke carries it a step further to tell us what happened after he did that. He fell uh, from that hung position. Whether he was cut down or whether the rope broke or whatever the fashion was by which he hung himself, he fell to the ground and he burst asunder. His bowels gushed out. That's very, uh, uh, very gross sounding, very disgusting, but nonetheless, that's what happened to Judas. Now, that became his habitation because that's where he was. That's where he remained. And it became desolate. The field of blood called a keldama. And it says here that, that it was purchased, that Judas purchased this field. Um, uh, well, he did because it was the money of Judas that purchased that field. Yes, the Pharisees, you know, took that money and purchased the field, but it was Judas's money that purchased it, and it was blood money that purchased it. So that field of blood uh, is what it was called. His habitation became desolate, and none dwelled therein because of knowledge of that field. The second thing that is said, his bishopric let another take his office, his official station let another fill that place. How did Peter know that? How did Peter come to think that Judas's place needed, uh, Judas's position needed a replacement. Well, remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19 and 28, when Peter had asked, we have left all, what do we get? And he told him that they would have uh, set on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes. And so Peter has enough reasoning power to understand that Judas's place has, he's gone to his own place. But he's also been given a responsibility because he was numbered with us and had us obtained a part of this ministry. Thus, that 12th spot needs to be filled in the purpose of the apostleship as given. He, he wasn't uh, one who um, was a successor to Judas. He was a replacement. And remember, when James dies in chapter 12, no replacement was made. And so we're not dealing with a succession of apostleship. We are stating that there was to be 12 apostles. Peter understood this from what Jesus had said in Matthew 19. Thus, and by the, the words of David through, that the Holy Spirit spoke through him, 
they had to fill that place. Now, they did it with one of two people. They knew that either Joseph, called Barsabbas, surnamed Justice, or Matthias would meet the qualifications. The two qualifications that had to be for an apostle, they had to have been with Jesus during his earthly ministry. No one here today can say that they've done that. No one since the time that Jesus lived could say they had done that. Number two, they also had to be a witness of the resurrection. Again, no one today could say that. Thus, no one today could qualify to be an apostle. But in that day, there were two men who met that quali those qualifications. And of those two men, only one could receive that position. And so they prayed about it. And, and they, they said, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. Now notice two things. One, the Lord knows the hearts. We're going to come back to that in just a minute. Number two, he's already been chosen. Show which one thou hast chosen. They indicate that the choice has already been made. It has nothing to do with them. They cast lots. Verse number 26, according to Linsky in his commentary, this was done by two markers being put in a container and then being shaken until so abruptly till one of those markers flew out. And that was the, the marker uh, indicating who was chosen. If that be the case, that's how they did it. And uh, the, the lot fell upon Matthias. He was numbered with the eleven. And he was counted as equal. He was just as relative or just as important as every one of these others. And so they have chosen. And thus we bring an end to that transitional period. We have Jesus telling them to wait. We are told why they needed to wait there. They went and they waited. They replaced Judas. And now when we embark on chapter 2, We'll be able to delve right into the establishment of the church or the, the inauguration of the kingdom, and we'll be able to look into those things. I want to end with this thought, though. He who knoweth the hearts of all men. I want you to think about that today as we close out and, and consider what the Lord knows about your heart. Jesus knows everything about you. In fact, John would say in 1 John chapter 2, if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. God knows everything about us. Just like he knew everything about Matthias and he knew everything about Barsabbas, he also knows everything about you. Is there something about you that needs to be corrected that God already knows about? Why not get it corrected? Does God know that? that you've obeyed the gospel? Does he know of the conviction of your heart in his son? And does he know that you are living faithfully to him? Well, he knows whether you are or not. God knows the heart. So as we close out our lesson, do think about that. Jesus set about to do a work that God gave him to do, and he finished it. Are you finishing the work that God has for you? And is your heart what it ought to be, knowing that God knows your heart?